Can we multiband an old CB radio and get it to work on the amateur bands? And if we did, would it be any good? There's been a discussion going on since time immemorial whether you can get these things to work on the amateur radio bands. Now, there's two distinct camps in this argument. You've got one side that says, well, theoretically, yes, you could get them to work. However, it would be so complicated and so much work, it simply wouldn't be worth the effort. And then you've got the other camp that basically says, categorically, no, you can't. They won't work. And even if you manage to get them onto the amateur bands, they simply wouldn't work properly. They're the wrong specifications. They're made of the wrong stuff. One of my favorites is, they've been deliberately designed so that you can't modify them. Mm. This radio behind me is 40 years old. It's completely analog. Well, I say completely analog. It has got a phase lock loop in it. I see quite a crude one at that. That has got some decade counting, divider, device, whatever in it. But apart from that, it's a totally analog device. And for me, if you're gonna modify something, that gives me a completely clean sheet. So, Let's talk a bit about these radios and where they've come from. And then we'll get into how they work and what we can do to modify them. Okay, so I picked up these uh, two Ham International CB radios off eBay. I paid £50 for the Multimode 2 and £150 for the base station. Now they've got the, exactly the same boards inside. And to be honest, what appealed to me is the fact that they're multi-mode. So they've got AM, FM, upper and lower sideband. Now I've looked uh, inside at the components. They don't seem to have any date codes. However, I've been reliably informed that these would have been manufactured around 1980. These two radios are both branded Ham International. 
they didn't manufacture them. Ham International are a Belgium distribution company who did, among other things, uh, you know, distribute CB radio equipment. They're still in business today. I think the name has changed. So the original manufacturer of this equipment was Cybernet. I know it sounds like something out of a Terminator movie, but that's who manufactured these, along with a lot of different types of radio. So what do we know about Cybernet? Well, from what I've managed to dig up on the internet, it appears from around the early 1970s, Cybernet was primarily a hi-fi component manufacturer based in Japan. They also manufactured, among other things, citizen band radios, and by 1976, following the CB boom over in the United States, Cybernet had become Japan's biggest manufacturer of this type of equipment. Now I came across this article, which I found rather interesting. It's from the New York Times archives, dated Boxing Day 1976. A foreign correspondent interviewed the then Cybernet president, Haruki Tomono. I hope I pronounced that correctly, probably not. Mr Tomono was very optimistic about the future of CB radio sales, even in the face of the current slump in the industry. So much so, Cybernet were ramping up CB radio production in the city of Kawasaki, just outside Tokyo, by converting an old bowling alley into a manufacturing facility. This was all spurred on, of course, following the FCC's decision to allow 40 channels for CB radio operators as opposed to 23. Cybernet Electronics carried on, however in 1979 it was acquired by the Japanese Kaisera Group and then around 1982 the Cybernet brand was simply absorbed into Kaisera. Now it's worth noting that when it came to this type of equipment Cybernet were primarily an OEM manufacturer and produced radios under the brand names such as Lafayette, RCA, General Electric, Craco and Midland along with dozens of other brand names including Ham International. Well, it's interesting that this was probably manufactured in an old bowling alley. Well, there's another piece of useless information, but there it is. Now, there's a couple of things to note here. Mainly, you've got to remember that Cybernet, during their time, most probably manufactured more two-way radios than the Japanese amateur radio manufacturers put together. And they got a few tricks up their sleeve, namely of which is how they could get such performance from such a low component count uh, equipment. Um, and that's the art to manufacturing, obviously. So this kind of pulls in a few issues because when you're actually interacting with them, a lot of this, the circuits in there have multi-functions. Anyway, let's get on, let's go through how these things work. The best place to start is the block diagram. This is a block diagram of our Cybernet receiver. There's nothing too remarkable about this, as it's an industry standard design. The type that you'd find in many receivers, new and old. Now there's a block diagram of sorts, on the lid of the base station, but to be honest, I couldn't make much sense of it, so I reverse engineered this from the circuit diagram, which we'll look at later on. This is a super heterodyne double conversion receiver. Super meaning above the range of human hearing, and heterodyne or heterodyning is the action of mixing signals together. The conversion amount i.e. double, single, triple, simply refers to the number of times the signal is mixed to an intermediate frequency. Okay, so 
I'm going to go through this in some detail. However, the video is indexed in the description, so you can jump ahead if you so wish. So let's look at a practical scenario for our cybernet receiver. Imagine we live here on the edge of town and Alex, the local radio nuisance, lives on the other side of town. Now Alex's radio is set to channel 19 and he suddenly has this brainwave where he decides to educate the other radio listeners into the virtues of his favourite music. Thank you for coming home, sorry that the chairs are all warm. I left them here, I could have sworn. These are my Meanwhile, George, who lives in the middle of town, is busy chatting away on Channel 40, along with his friends discussing his latest ailments and health issues. I, I went to the doctors and they gave me this new medication. I said, I, I can't take that. Anyway, he just looked at me and I said, well, why, do you, why have I got to take this? It, it's not me feet that are the problem. George and Alex are totally oblivious to each other's signals and their radio signals are travelling off into the ether along with shortwave radio broadcasts. <laughs> GPS and communication satellite signals. Time clock transmissions. Wireless baby alarms. Television and radio broadcasts. Wi Fi, Bluetooth, mobile phones. Taxi and emergency services signals. Amateur radio transmissions. The fact is. By the time Alex and George's signals hit our antenna, they're accompanied with an absolute plethora of other signals, and it's the receiver's job to sort all this lot out. So, we have Alex and George's signals arriving at our antenna, along with a plethora of other signals. Plethora. I like that word, I don't think it's really a radio term. So a radio signals travel from the antenna via the SO239 socket into the transmitter output stage and then onto the AC coupling and protection circuits. The signals pick up DC from the transmitter stage and the AC coupling will block the DC and only let the RF signals pass. And the overload protection circuit is there to limit very strong signals traveling into the receiver. This is mainly for when the radio is in transmit mode. So our signals will pass through this stage and move on to the bandpass filter. This is a graphical illustration of our filter. However, in reality, it would look somewhat different. The vertical axis is the output level and the horizontal axis is the frequency. The red line represents the frequency response of the filter. So inside the red line, this is known as the band pass area and outside the red line is the band stop areas. We've got a center frequency, FC, of 27 megahertz. We've got a lower frequency, FL, of 26 megahertz. And a higher frequency, FH, of 28 megahertz. So this filter has a 2 megahertz bandwidth, which is FH minus FL. So Alex and George's signals are in the bandpass area of the filter and all the other signals the plethora are in the band stop area so only Alex and George's signals will pass through to the next stage. We now move on to the RF amplifier. 
The amplifier's primary function is to amplify small signals into larger, more manageable signals. However, it also controls the signal levels going into the receiver and even acts as an attenuator when needed. This is to control the signal levels so that we don't undersupply or overload the receiver. The amplifier is controlled by the gain control and the AGC circuits. We'll talk a little bit more about this later. Okay, so now we move on to the DC switch. This is again a sort of protection stage. It's simply for when the radio is in transmission mode, it will switch on and collapse all the stray RF coming from the transmitter. As we're currently in receive mode, our signals will pass through to the next stage. So now we move on to the RF mixer. The mixer does exactly what it says on the tin. It mixes the incoming RF signals with the local oscillator. This creates some and different frequency products. The receiver uses these products as intermediate frequencies, known as IF for short. So let's go through this. The selector is telling the RF synthesizer the radio is set to channel 19. We're in AM mode of operation and the synthesizer will carry out a calculation. Now bear in mind that our receive frequency is channel 19 27.185 megahertz. So the synthesizer will produce the first LO with a frequency of 37.88 megahertz. How it arrives at this figure is that it calculates the sum of the IF frequency and the required receive frequency. In this case, the receiver's IF frequency is 10. 0.695 megahertz and that's for AM, FM and upper sideband. For lower sideband the IF calculation is 10.692. Why this is different we'll cover as we go on. Let's look at what we'd expect to see at the output of the RF mixer. So in the middle here we have our fundamental signals. Alex and George's signals on channel 19 and 40. And we also have our first LO at 37.88 megahertz. Now these are first order products. If we look further up the scale, we've got George and Alex's signals up at around 66 megahertz. This is the sum of the first LO and the RF signals. So if we look down the scale we've got Alex's signal on 10.695 megahertz and George's signal on 10.475 megahertz. This is the first LO frequency minus Alex and George's signals. These are known as second order products. We're only interested in the lower frequency signals so the primary function of this mixer is down conversion. Okay, so as we are on the AM, FM, IF path, we now move on to the low pass filter. As the name suggests, this filter only lets low frequency signals pass. Now I haven't tested the response of this filter. However, I imagine the cutoff point is around 15 megahertz. So the filter will remove the high frequency products from the IF. So we're only left with Alex and George at around 10, 11 megs. This is important as we don't want the other signals passing to the next stage. So now we move on to the IF mixer. And this behaves in the same way as the RF mixer and again, we're only interested in the down conversion products. We have our second LO, this time at 10.24 megahertz. This is a fixed frequency signal and doesn't change when tuning the receiver. The LO is derived from the synthesizer board 
However, it comes directly from the PLL timing crystal and is not derived from the VCO. Let's look at what we would see on the output of the mixer. So, as before, we've got our first order products and the sum products. And looking down the scale, so we now have Alex on 0.455 MHz, 455 kilohertz, and George on 0.235 megahertz, which is 235 kilohertz. We now move on to the IF amplifier to boost the signals. And then we move on to the ceramic filter. This is a bandpass filter. It's called a ceramic filter simply because of the materials it's made up from, but it's just a narrow bandpass filter. The filter has a center frequency of 455 kilohertz, a lower frequency of 452 kilohertz, and a higher frequency of 458 kilohertz, which gives us a six kilohertz bandwidth. George's signal is now in the band stop area, and Alex's signal is now square in the middle of the band pass area. So that means that only Alex's signal will pass to the next stage. As our receiver is set to AM receive mode, we now move to the AM demodulator. This will remove the carrier and produce an audio signal. The audio signal passes down to the audio amplifier. And bingo jingo, we've got Spandau Ballet blasting out of our loudspeaker. Okay, so let's look at the single sideband section of the receiver. The signal path through the front end is the same as before. However, the IF signals are now picked up directly from the output of the RF mixer. They then move on to the crystal filter. The crystal filter is yet another bandpass filter, but this time with a much narrower bandwidth. So let's imagine we've got both an upper and a lower sideband signal with suppressed carriers. The selector is set to channel 19 and we're in USB mode of operation. As before, the synthesizer will produce an LO of 37.88 megahertz. This represents our crystal filter. We have a center frequency, FC, of 10.695 megahertz and a total bandwidth of 2.7 kilohertz. We have the upper sideband signal in the bandpass area of the filter and the lower sideband signal is in the band stop area so only the USB signal will pass to the next stage. Now if you're wondering why the lower sideband signals are up the scale rather than down. This is because when the mixer LO frequency is higher than the signals, it will transpose the frequency position of the down converted products. Okay, so let's change the mode to lower sideband. The synthesizer IF calculation will now change to 10.692. This will have the effect of offsetting the first LO by minus three kilohertz. If we now look at our filter, the lower sideband signal has now shifted into the bandpass area of the filter. The upper sideband is now in the band stop area. So now only the LSB signal will pass to the next stage. Okay, so now we'll move on to the IF amplifier, which will boost the signal and then on to the single sideband product detector. As we only have a single sideband signal, the product detector introduces a carrier, which is derived from the carrier oscillator. The single sideband signal is mixed with the carrier, which results in the signal then resembling 
an AM signal. And this is demodulated in a similar way. The carrier oscillator produces a clean sinusoidal waveform and the frequency is matched to the IF. If the carrier oscillator frequency doesn't match the IF, then the audio will become unintelligible. The detector produces an audio signal and follows the same path as before. Okay, so what can we do to extend the receiver coverage on one of these radios? Well, you know, we've got an IF that's fixed. So that's at 10.695 megs, that doesn't move. So the information that we want to receive and actually pass through the receiver is always gonna be at 10.695 megs. That's the idea of the super heterodyne type receiver. So we move up the stream a little bit, we get to the mixer. We simply change the LO to suit the frequency that we want. And we know the calculation. It's the IF frequency plus the receive frequency. And that, that will give us our frequency of what we need for the LO. And then if we go further up, you know, we're looking at the bandpass filter. So obviously, if we wanted 20 meters, we've got to make sure we've got a bandpass filter that covers the 20 metre band. Now you'd think that would be pretty straightforward to do. However, things aren't quite that simple. The problem is, within these radios, the components in the front end won't lend themselves to going, you know, way off frequency. Because they were actually, you've got to remember, this was designed as a mono band radio. So what they've used, and you know, this is, you know, it's older technology. So you don't get this sort of big bandwidths. And there's a lot of tuned circuits and all sorts in the front, and they just will not lend themselves to, to going down to, you know, dramatically away from what it was intended for. So, What's the solution? Well, it's a very simple one. We dump the whole front end, get rid of it. Even the mixer, you get rid of it. Get shot of it, the lot. It sounds dramatic, I know, but in reality, it's actually really simple. There's a couple of issues with the IF as well. There's a well, there's two problems, and one of which is that the AM-FM section, because the IF is common bus, the AM-FM se section, where the 10.240 mixes up in the IF mixer, that 10.240 component gets onto the common bus and in turn gets into this single sideband receiver which will do which is degrading the performance and the reason he does this is because 10.240 is quite close to the IF frequency and signals we get into modulation products they mix up and it degrades and I, I have actually seen it it degrades the performance of the sideband um, receiver. Now, there's more. The single sideband section of the receiver has, you basically, on the IF, it goes in to a crystal filter. Now the impedance at this stage is, I haven't taken it out and put it on the vector analyzer, but I imagine about 250 ohms. Now the AM-FM section seems to work fine at 50 ohms. So we've got an impedance mismatch. On the block diagram, it's gonna look something like this. 
So I'm going to completely remove the receiver front end, including the RF mixer. And then using SMA sockets, I'm going to make two IF insertion points. One for the AMFM IF section and another for the SSB IF section. I'm also going to add a simple impedance matching circuit for the SSB injection point. So let's quickly run through the schematic and see what this looks like. Okay, so this is the Cybernet um, transceiver schematic in its entirety. Okay, so our signal comes in via the SO239 socket and travels up to the transmitter output stage. The signals pass through this array of inductors and capacitors. This is the low pass filter for the transmitter. This will also affect our receive signals. We then move on to the receiver front end section of the schematic. So we've got C100. This is our AC coupling capacitor, which blocks the DC coming from the transmitter. We also have D18 and D19 back to back diodes, which makes up our overload protection. The signal then passes through an RF transformer, T7. We now move on to Q20, which is the RF amplifier, which is voltage controlled at this point by the gain control and the AGC circuits. The voltage swing at this point is around 0.6 of a volt to 1.8 volts. We then move on to T8. C104 and T9. This is a two order bandpass filter and T9, once the signal passes through, steps down the impedance and then supplies Q22, the RF mixer. The first LO comes in at this point and joins the base of Q22 with the receive signals. The output of Q22 provides the IF frequencies and the IF comes away from T10, which then supplies the AM and SSB sections of the receiver. Okay, so it is that time, the inevitable. You knew it was coming, so let's just get on with it. The front end has got to go. Why does it have to go, Daddy? It's because it's not very good, son. Okay, so this is the underside of the base station. This board here is the synthesizer board, and this is obviously the main board. We've got um, our AM insertion point here. This is a little coupling capacitor, and this is our single sideband insertion point here, and this is just a little trimmer capacitor and a variable inductor and that's to match the impedance so this is all 50 ohms and we're matching the impedance to the crystal filter okay so this is our schematic with the front end taken away so our insertion points are here that's that coupling capacitor so at this point here I've connected an SMA um, socket. I've also connected into this point here. Now there was a diode there. I've just got rid of it. What we've put here is a 
a little impedance matching circuit, which I'll go through in a second. We're also picking up at this point here. This is our AGC and gain control. And that's all that's coming away from the radio. And this is coming from the synthesizer. And that's your first LO. So this is the little circuit that I've knocked up for the impedance matching of the single sideband IF. Obviously we've got the, we're coming at 50 ohms. We've got a little 120 picofarad ceramic capacitor. That's, I think it's 50 volts. <clears throat> and I've got this little 1.8 to 3.7 microhenry um, variable inductor. It's, the inductor was actually designed for a 10.7 IF. So the permeability of the material, the iron dust is suitable for this sort of frequency because of course we fixed we're at 10.695. The uh, output is around 200 plus ohms, I'm not quite sure, but it does peak up. So this makes quite a substantial difference to the performance of the single sideband. Okay, so we've now got our front end now removed. I mean, it doesn't actually have to come out of the radio. Uh, I might have kind of over dramatized that just a little bit. Um, so we can stay on the radio, we just basically bypass it. Um, if you're playing along at home, you probably notice that on the circuit diagram, the positions of the stages may look a bit back to front, um, you know, compared to the circuit diagram. Now, if you look at the circuit diagram, the front end, the components within the front end, i.e. bandpass filter, DC switch, RF uh, amplifier, they're, pretty, they're all nested they're embedded together um, and and this will cause a major complication if you want to try and um, modify it because simply you know you find you may change something here where you might get a bit of success and then at the other side here you'll knock something out of whack and you'll just find that you'll just keep chasing your tail trying to get the thing onto other frequencies and there was another thing as well, um, is because we're not using the front end in the radio, we've now disengaged the noise blanker circuit. Now, I know a lot of people seem to think, oh, well, I don't need noise blanker, but, you know, I've looked at the circuit, it looks like a quite a comprehensive circuit. I haven't quite figured out exactly how it works, but I think the idea is, that it samples the, you know, the incoming receive signals after, after or in the bandpass filter, as it's doing in this case, goes through and then it identifies what's noise. So it'll have a parameter. It'll amplify that noise and then inversely print it onto the IF and hence noise cancelling it should in theory, cancel the, the noise. Now, I know a lot of analog uh, noise blankers can be quite effective. So um, I'd like to put that back in, but that's something I'm gonna have to have a look at. Okay, so now we're gonna need to rebuild the front end. Um, now this isn't, you know, isn't as bad as it sounds. In fact, it's pretty straightforward. You know, there's the things that we want in the front end is good linearity. So, you know, that's to frequency. So, I'm going to have a look at uh, mixers. So, I've got a, a mixer here. This is a active double balance mixer. It's got the analog devices 831 
uh, IC on there, which is dedicated to HF, VHF uh, operation. It's perfect. Now, this is a circuit which is basically on the data sheet. It's the example circuit and somebody's made it into an evaluation board. Now these are really, really good value. Um, the IC on here, I, it costs I think about 13 pounds plus VAT from Farnell. Now I bought this whole board with the thing on it, you know, the IC, and it cost me about eight UK pounds delivered. So you can't really go wrong. It's already made up. It needs nine volts to supply it. But the real advantages to using something like this is that it's really linear. So this thing will run from 100 kilohertz to 500 megahertz. The uh, LO only needs to be at minus 10 dBm. Whereas opposed to in the radio, the radio's LO is about zero D, dBm. So if you were to use that, you'd need to use an attenuator. So you can do that by putting three resistors together. You know, there's RF calculators online to show you how to do that. Or you can simply just put a little, you know, 10 dB attenuator, and screw it onto the LO. So we've got an LO socket. We've got, which one? Yeah, that's the RF in and that's the IF out. It's, it's as simple as that. Um, it's, uh, it's a nice bit of kit. And also as well, you know, with the low uh, LO um, signal, um, it's, it's quite a nice thing to have because if you look at you know, mini circuits, there's other got people make double balance mixes, but they're just basically diode packs. And you need an LO with a high level to, to uh, drive them. It's simply because you've got to get the diodes actually going hard on and off uh, in forward and reverse bias. So it's to get the, the mixing effect. And if you've got high LOs, it brings on other issues because then, you know, you've got to screen the thing because you don't want the stray RF getting into uh, the rest of the circuits. But this is super linear, really, really um, good bit of kit. And also with double balance mixes, you know, the LO and the, the, um, the you know, the RF signals come in, a lot of it gets cancelled out. Uh, when it gets onto the IF, which is a good thing. So, um, you know, it reduces the threat of intermodulation products. But uh, yeah, I think it was about eight pounds delivered from Amazon. So, if we have a look at RF amplifiers, again, we can go modules, it's all standardized impedance, 50 ohms in, 50 ohms out. Now this one uses a little MMIC device. We've got, you know, it's nice and linear. It's low noise. And we've got a range from 100 kilohertz to two gigahertz, I believe. Now the operating voltage of this is, and it's set on the sheet, the people who supplied it, nine volts. But I, to be honest, I wouldn't give it nine volts. So um, the data sheet basically says maximum eight for that device. That's a little Hewlett Packard device. Uh, I'll leave a link in the description. But again, super linear. And we all, oh, it's 30 dB gain on this. And one other useful thing with these, if you actually adjust the voltages and you know, bring it up and down, you're actually adjusting the gain and it doesn't really upset the linearity that much. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty good. Um, and I think that was about five, six pounds delivered. So it's not gonna, it's gonna hardly break the bank. Okay, so we're gonna need a bandpass filter. 
Now, I have one here, wherever it's gone. Uh, here it is. This is a bandpass filter for 20 meters. It's 50 ohms in, 50 ohms out. So we've got a nice 50 ohm convention happening in the front end. This uh, I picked up from an outfit called QRP Labs. Uh, I think they're just they're just an online um, distributor of I think yeah it's just all ham kits because this obviously was a kit for them when I got it. So you just have to solder the components. Then they make them for all the bands. So they cost four nine dollars ninety nine. That's US each um, and they work really well so this covers you know the 20 meter band which is 14 megs to 14.35 if memory serves but they do go a little over but yeah they work good you've got the insertion loss is about 2.5 uh, db which is pretty good um the only thing is you got to wind the toroidal transformers yourself and um then i just they do tend to fill up with the the copper but uh yeah four dollars 99 qrp labs can't go wrong that actually works a check so i've just soldered the sma connectors on it just so ease of use basically I've got another bandpass filter here. This one comes ready made, uses surface mount components. This is from a company called Yanni Labs. Again, it's 50 ohms in, 50 ohms out. So this is general coverage and it will cover from 1.6 to 56 megahertz. And that's across seven bands. Um, I was a little skeptical about this, if I'm honest, because you know, you've got to be careful how much information you let into uh, the mixer. So if you start putting too much information into the mixer, you have to start attenuating uh, because it, it'll it start, you know, the intermodulation products will start to pick up um, and in, you know, in turn makes noise, it degrades the performance. But that being said, I've been running this on an antenna, you know, and into that mixer. And this is a works an absolute treat. It really works well. It was a little pricey, but um, really good. And you've got some good coverage on there. So, you know, you can get your six meters. Um, it says 1.5 or 1.6, that's the lowest frequency. But you can take it below there. You notice I had, um, medium wave uh, station running on the example and you're just starting to to go off the edge of the you know start to get onto the cliff of the the filter so so you, you're taking it about one and a half megs and that's it she'll uh, it drops off like a stone now the thing is with hf hf is a funny band you know and the bandwidth of filters can be quite deceiving especially when you, you, know, you you've got it plugged onto an antenna because the very nature of HF we get shortwave radio stations that can suddenly just pop up sporadically in and before you know it it's getting into your the, you know into your mixer and your signal level that comes back with your AGC doesn't see that it's only looking at your, the signal you're tuned to and um, you know it gives rise to you know we get a thing called third order products a third order products can be quite troublesome but it's quite a big subject and for a I just want to try and keep the this video short. But when we go through the modules, 
which I will in the next video. Uh, we'll go a bit more in depth into the modules and then, you know, we'll cover a bit more of the fundamentals and things you need to look out for. But anyway, yeah, Yanni Labs, really good, you know. So, oh, I don't know that I mentioned. This, to switch this, this uses pin diodes. And um, we've got these little headers on here. So you give, you know, the band you want five volts. It's very little current. And it'll switch that band on. So then it'll start that, that band going across your input and output. Yeah. Yanni lads, if you're watching, well done. So we've got other bandpass filters. I've got another one here. This is one I got from a Canadian outfit. I can't remember what they're called. But uh, this covers the air band. So this does from 118 to 138 megahertz. Tiny little thing. I think it was less than 20 pounds. Works really well. Um, it's got very good band stop for the uh, commercial FM uh, broadcast frequencies. And uh, yeah, this this brilliant. Works great with the mixer. I've got other ones. I don't know where they are. I've also got them, got them for uh, 70 centimetres and cover the two metre band. Um, you can, but you can buy a lot of these things off now. You can buy them from Amazon, eBay. You know, there's a lot of the Chinese uh, are making a lot of these modules in general. And, and hats off to them, fair call, because it don't have to make my life easy. Because the thing is, you know, when you look, you know, these days, a lot of stuff surface now. And, you know, if you're constructing your own stuff, it, get, it doesn't have to get fiddly. And, you know, it's quite hit and miss. And if you look at the manufacturers, they do make evaluation boards. You know, so it's just for that mixer, for example. You can buy an evaluation board for it. Now, I know from RS Components in the UK, they want over £100 for that. Uh, I think it's even more plus, you know, plus taxes for the evaluation board. Um, and this seems to be pretty typical of a lot of component manufacturers. Um, and it's a shame, really. But hats off to the Chinese. This, uh, I, I don't know who's doing it. There's, I think there's a few outfits at it. But they're just remaking the... They're just copying the evaluation boards. And the, and the circuit of the evaluation board is nine times out of ten the example circuit that's in the data sheet. It's as simple as that. And you've got to pay attention to keep the linearity. There's obviously a bit of work in the circuit board development. They use strip line um, so we get nice, you know, balance, um, capacitive and uh, inductive, you know, rejection. So, you know, it, it just stays nice and linear. And I've tested a lot of these modules on my test equipment on the analyzers and they're as, they're as good as gold, especially what I need them for, for something like this. So just to put in perspective, using modules like this in your front end, you know, you've taken a radio that had a really crude front end, you know, for want of a better word, um, to something that's got a really, really dynamic frequency range, super low noise gain, um, and the results, well, I'll let you see for yourself. So let's go on to the bench. We'll set some of these up and uh, let's have a play with them and uh, see what we get. Okay, so we set up on the bench. Um, I've got an antenna coming in. This is connected to, hold on, I've basically got a, it's a mini whip. Um, it's a little active antenna. Um, I live in a first floor flat apartment. 
um, at the bottom of a hill in northwest London. And I've basically got a mini whip against the window because I don't have a garden. So, um, yeah, so there is, I do get high noise, noise floor as well, just so you're aware. So we connected up in through into our QRP Labs 20 meters bandpass filter. Got a back to back SMA connector. This is our mixer with the AD831 mixer IC. We've got our first LO, which is coming from my signal generator, another back to back SMA. And we're using the um, amplifier module as an IF amplifier. And this then connects to the SSB IF um, input point. Now, I haven't got, got the amplifier here because this unit has got plenty of gain in it. So I think you get about seven to 10 dB of gain. And on the HF band, we really don't need that gain at the front. Um, you know, obviously amplifiers have noise, you know, they've got, a, they've got a noise figure. So if we've got the amplifier wide open, which we do, because remember we're trying to pick up microvolts up here, you know, it's better not to have the amplifier at that position if you can get away with it. So, and in this, in this case we can. Now if you look at this board at the back here, this is a little board I've just knocked up. <clears throat> I've got a switching transistor. This is a little Darlington TAP120, which the TX, uh, sorry, the RX8, um, or I think it's 7.5 volts, switches on. That's when the radio is in receive mode, and that will switch that transistor on, which in turn will supply these two regulators. One's 9 volts, and the other one's this one at the end here is 5. We've got some little five volt headers that come away from the board. And also on the nine volt rail, we've got, I've got these little, you can't really see them, there's some transistors there uh, for these two outputs. It's so I can actually adjust the voltage to the amplifier modules. But uh, obviously the mix is just fixed nine volts. Okay, so what we shall do, let's go up to the signal generator. Okay, so we're gonna use this as our LO. <clears throat> it's good for experimenting, and obviously you wouldn't want something like this being lumped around with something like this, <clears throat> i.e. the cost and also the size. This is bigger than the ratio, but uh, for on the bench and experimenting, this is perfect. So, there's a good feature on here. Obviously, this is our LO coming away. So, oh, that needs tightening up. So, our output level, as we remember, is minus 10 dBm. So, we'll set that here. Okay. Now, we've got another feature on here, which is offset which we can set. Now what this will do, if I set the offset, it just means that what's displayed here will be the receive frequency. So if I put the IF in here, which is minus 10.695 megahertz. Is that hertz or megahertz? I'll do that again. Minus. That's better. Okay, and then we can go to our frequency. And obviously we're on 20 meters, so we want to go 14 something, 14.252. It's a good a frequency as any. Okay, yeah, our RF is on. So what we need to do is power up the radio. Activity there, so we can get a better focus on them. 
Now you can see I've got quite a bit of a noise floor here, so another Now, of course, we've got no control. It's not doing anything because we've bypassed it. Now, this isn't the way to test the performance of a radio, putting it on in an antenna, but it's a lot more fun And just a demonstration of what it can do. Obviously, we're in upper side band. Serious noise going on there. Okay, so as you can see, that's working, but there's certainly room for improvement. Um, we need an AGC. Also, I'm only supplying the single sideband section. So let's go to the bench and we'll, we'll uh, try a different configuration. Okay, so what we're going to do now, I'm going to put some attenuation on the front here. Now there's a number of reasons for this. It means we can control what's actually going into the mixer. Now I've made this voltage controlled attenuator. I don't know if you can see that so I can focus in. This is totally the actual component, which is a, a pin diode set. Uh, this is an, an NXP device. So it's literally sitting in the center there. So you can see it's very small. There's minimal components. And the only reason we look, there's a board on top. So it needs five volts for bias. And then I've got naught to 10 volts to control the, the RF levels passing through. Now this works really well. I, I may make a video on how I made this, uh, but again, this was from the, this is copying the example um, circuit diagram that's on the data sheet. Okay, so if we take a look now, we're looking quite a bit more uh, sophisticated. Look at that, tighten up. So let's just run through this. Now, I've got my voltage controlled attenuator. Obviously the antenna's coming in here. <clears throat> this is using the NXP um, pin diode device. I'll leave a link to it. Um, they're very cheap and I think it cost me about 70p for the uh, device. Um, this is controlled, so I've got five volts um, bias yeah, that runs the bias to the um, to the the actual device and then I've got the control voltage now what this control voltage is coming from now on I think it's this green wire here coming from the radio that's that pickup point for the AGC and gain control and it goes into an operational amplifier where it buffers because I don't want to um, load any of the circuitry within the radio and then it goes on to another little op amp where it amplifies it to a level that's high enough to swing this so if we turn on the radio so come up here This 
work in there. The AGC is also, also working. Okay, so if we go back down, we'll have a look at... I hear that guy all the time. Slab cars on these names. Right, so... <clears throat> so, voltage controlled, controlled attenuator, which is um, our AGC, and gain controls now um, controlling the levels going into the radio. We don't have an RF amp at the front end. We're now running into this Yanni Labs uh, multiband filter, which, you know, it's obviously it's a bandpass filter. And this is um, currently set to uh, the 14.5 meg. No, this is the 14 meg mark. There's a number of settings on there. And then obviously we come out of there, go into our mixer, LO comes in, and now we've come onto this little bad boy. Now all that is is just a coaxial splitter. It's a 50 ohm splitter. So to keep the impedance on the circuit, and I want to split it into two, I've just used that. Again, very cheap. Um, so one side goes to the SSB IF and the other side through another amplifier. This is a different amplifier to that one. No particular reason why. Uh, this is a, again, similar sort of price. Again, I bought it off Amazon and we'll go through the, so but that's the AM FM IF input point. So if I can find it. And now switch it on to AM. You can, you know, what AM sounds like. So, the advantage of doing this, there's there's a number of things that are, are good here, which is different bands have got different characteristics. So, you can actually adjust the IF gain for different bands, and then you can also control with the attenuator how much information is going into the mixer. And you've, you, it means you've got complete control. We could make it a little bit more elaborate and obviously get the AGC to actually start pulling the um, IF back. But to be honest, this seems to work quite well. Um, now I've got a breadboard set up here for the multi-band filter. This is simply five volts, and that little device you see there is a resistor array. Now basically, they're 6.8K, the common uh, boat bus to ground. So I'm pulling down all the inputs, and then I just take five volts and put it onto the relevant filter. Now you can do that with switches or with controllers, you see. I'll take it out of band. Doesn't, yeah, it does a bit, but that's the one. So you'd literally switch the bands and then Okay, so let's say we want to go to 40 meters. So we just put in 7.1 megahertz. God, we've got some noise on there. Move the bandpass filter down one. Switch it to lower sideband. I've got too much noise here. Yeah, the band doesn't seem like it's open today. What is this? That's a 
that would be a shortwave radio station just out of the mate. What's that on? Some shortwave band on uh, 7.341 meters. Now, it doesn't help because the filter we've got set in this is six kilohertz. So the broadcast bands are, you know, a bit wider than that. So, you know, we're a bit narrow for it. But uh, we can, you can change the ceramic filters in this. It's very straightforward. Okay, well, that about, that's it really. I mean, unfortunately, I don't, you know, the conditions are not very good and I don't have a very good antenna. <clears throat> okay, you see what I mean about shortwave radio stations can just pop up. So we're just outside of the 20 meter band here. You know, and the thing is, you know, if that starts, if that gets into your mixer on the 20 meter band, which it will be doing, you'll, uh, things like this start swamping the mixer, you know. It's on AM. That's strong, you can even, even the FM's de demodulated it. Okay, so we've got another configuration here. Obviously, this time I'm using a uh, two meter 70 sems uh, antenna. Again, we've got the voltage control uh, attenuator. And this is a tubular um, bandpass filter. This covers about 410 to about 530 megs, if I can remember. Uh, that's coming round, and we've now got a low noise um, amplifier. This is from Newelec. It's 20 dB. This is, well, it's an actual, it's an ultra low noise. And then we go into our mixer, we've got an IF amplifier. And then we're going in on the AM FM. We are currently on 70 centimeters, which is 433 megahertz. So, uh, yeah, thank you, David. G0 CAG mobile uh, from G3 EFX. Okay, just uh, a couple of things come up. Uh, Well, I'm going to stop the video here. Um, I think we really did nail the receiver there in these Cybernet uh, radios. There is more to it, obviously. But um, I'd like to think that somebody has a little bit of knowledge of um, how these things work. Probably, Hopefully, it's come away with a little, little bit more. Because I've seen, you know, I've learned as well. I mean, I... I got the thing as a project. I thought, you know what? Let's go and try and do the impossible. So, and then I just started picking it apart piece by piece. So, in the next videos, we're gonna look at the transmitter stage. Um, we're also going to look at the synthesizer. You know, we're gonna work out how they work, sort of break them down and you know what we can do to modify them um also i'm going to look at the modules you know we've got these really interesting modules unfortunately just running out of time in this video and i i'd like to have gone a bit more in depth with them i mean i'm learning at the same time as well so you know i've got a little bit of knowledge but uh, but i'm learning at the same time as well so 
I find it really interesting. And, you know, trying to get modern uh, technology to mesh with, you know, sort of, you know, yesteryear uh, technology is quite interesting. I was quite impressed with the fact that uh, we managed to get the thing working on uh, 70 sems, which I was quite, I thought that was quite an achievement. And to be fair, it works pretty well. Uh, there are improvements that we can make, I know there are, but uh, it's there. Now, I, I can imagine um, the RF officiados will be going nuts, because obviously this isn't the way to test the radio, obviously. But um, I don't know, if you're watching from YouTube, it's nice to see things, you know, <laughs> working you know I, I sort of I think it, I think it's really good so uh, in, in the final video of the series we'll do some serious performance testing um, and you know what we can do to get the performance you know where what I'd like it to be and we'd see you know how it stacks up against modern radio equipment you know the the icons and the Yasus and and the what have you's Oh, that's a 70 SEMS uh, repeater. Just sending out his call in Morse. I'm quite impressed with that. So, uh, I would like to say a big thank you to all the people that have uh, sub subscribed to my channel um, over the years and, uh, and the support. And I've really enjoyed it. It's really been nice because uh, I've just met a, a really nice community of people, and uh, and I, you know, it's, it's good. YouTube it brings people together, like-minded people. So uh, you know, there it is. Um, there's a couple of things I need to say. Um, Alex and George are obviously totally fictitious characters. Um, yeah, they don't relate to anybody live or dead. So, uh, you know, I just I just thought I'd better put that in there. Um, but that's about it, really. So I'm actually looking forward to making the next video. So, I'm going to leave you with me making this uh, voltage-controlled um, attenuator because um, uh, I've got quite a lot of acknowledgements and uh, people to thank so thanks for watching <laughs>